Ah, The Northman. Not exactly what I would consider to be one of my favourite films, but as an experience overall, I quite enjoyed it. But we all know what you're here for. How historically accurate is it in its representation of the Norse? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to my office. I've got a lot to say about the Northman, and I'd like to begin by reading a little bit of an article, one of the many that I've read concerning this film, because in this article they are interviewing Professor Price, who is basically the historical advisor to Robert Eggers, the producer of the film, and the interviewer asks the following question. The Northman has been hailed as the most historically accurate Viking movie ever made. Do you agree with that assessment? To this question, the professor says, yes, I do think that's an accurate description. Okay, so this statement has a lot to answer for. Is it really the most historically accurate movie representing the Norse? Well, if we look at this question comparatively speaking, that I could say, well, yes, sure, I mean, compared to the sort of usual rubbish that we see when it comes to historical accuracy and the Norse, in that case, comparatively speaking, Probably it is one of the most historically accurate, in fact, particularly in the costume department and the representation of the architecture, I was quite impressed. And you will see that there are some things, such as this Valkyrie and her braces, that, you know, anyone could look at that and say, were they out of their mind? There is some justification for that too, and I'll get to it towards the later part of the video. But suffice to say that, yes, I'm impressed with some of the things that are represented in the film. If we look at it in a vacuum, so not comparing to the rubbish that we usually see, is this film very historically accurate? And my answer to that would be no. There are still some things that I believe are not good choices when it comes to the representations of the Norse of this specific time period. Still, if you are into Norse history and culture, you're probably going to enjoy The Northman, so you should totally watch it. Just don't go around weird websites trying to stream it. That could be very dangerous. In fact, talking about danger and cybersecurity, today we've got a really cool sponsor, NordPass. NordPass is a simple, easy to use and very secure password manager that saves your passwords, credit cards and important information in one safe vault, created by the cybersecurity expert who built NordVPN, the advanced online security and privacy app trusted by more than 14 million users worldwide. Well, why do you need a password manager, you say? Well, most of us, without even realizing, tend to store all of our passwords on our browsers, say Safari or Google Chrome. Now, that's not safe. Not so long ago, I was hacked and I've even got a dedicated video to the whole horrible experience. All my passwords were hacked. I had to change them all. I lost data. I lost days of work because I had to format my entire computer. It was a nightmare. All of that happened because I had all my passwords without any protection. That's what a lot of people think. They think, oh, it's never gonna happen to me. Don't make the same mistake as I did. Now, I always have my passwords very well protected. NordPass is an excellent choice because it's not just a password manager. It stores all of your passwords in one place, so no need to memorize all of them. You can shop and browse faster because you can securely store your credit card and personal details on NordPass. It also has a data breach scanner. I wish I had this one when I had that problem. Through this scanner, you can find out if your online account or credit card information has been leaked, identifying where and when the leak happened and what type of data was compromised. And also, it helps you with password health. In other words, you can use password health to check if your passwords are weak, older than 90 days, or used for several accounts. Did you know that every year, NordPass conducts global research to find out the top 200 most commonly used passwords, and 123456 is not only one of the most common passwords used in the world, but it is also in the top 10 here in the US. So what are you waiting for? Today is the day. Click the link in the description below and use my code METATRON or use this URL code. Get an exclusive NordPass deal plus one additional month for free. And don't forget to use my code METATRON at the checkout. Be smart. Update your cybersecurity today. Time period is the first thing I'd like you to focus on. I'm going to now read something that we are told at the very beginning of the movie, which already sort of kind of gave me a little bit of that eyebrow tick that you get when you're watching something and you are, you know, a little disturbed or bothered by something you hear. But it is imperative to remember the date 
in which the film is supposedly set in, 895 AD. As a first point, I'd like to begin with the introduction we get in the movie, the description of the fiery gates of hell. Hear me, Odin, at the fiery gates of hell, a prince destined for Valhall. Already at the very beginning of the film, we are noticing a couple of interesting factors. First of all, they are using actual Old Norse pronunciation and words when they say Odin, when they say Valhall instead of Valhalla. And I really appreciate that and it's something that we see throughout the entirety of the movie. That already shows me that when it comes to these typical, specific words that belong to the uh, Norse culture of the Viking Age. I like the fact that they did their research, they talked to experts. With that being said though, this sentence really baffles me. At the fiery gates of hell. Now notice that hell is spelled with one L, which means that they are talking about the Norse concept of hell, which is very different from the hell spelled with two L's, so the Christian idea of a hell. The two terms, the one we use in the Christian modern age and the one that is used by the Vikings, do share the same linguistic origin with the meaning of hidden. But apart from that, they are two completely different places. And the only reason why in English we use the term hell, which is clearly a pagan or heathen origin, is because the early Christian monks, where they were trying to preach to the Norse, trying to help them understand and accept the Christian theological ideas of the underworld and hell and Satan, they decided to use a term that they would understand. And that is the only reason why, even in modern day English, we are using a pagan word to represent the Christian concept of the inferno. But the real very interesting question here is, did the Norse concept of hell with one L have fiery gates? When we look at the Norse mythology, we see that they most likely believed in the concept of the nine realms. Many of these realms are quite famous. You've got Asgard, you've got Midgard, but then you've got others that are not really described in much details, one of which is the underworld. Now, given the term hell can mean both the place and the goddess daughter of Loki. So from this time onward, I'm gonna use the term Helheim to actually mean the place. This is not a term that most likely the original Norse in the Viking Age would have used to, ma to mean the place, but it is a term that is used in later literature. But one thing we do know is that there were two primordial realms called Niflheimr and Muspelheimr. Now the first one was a place of mist, frozen wasteland and darkness, and that's the place that is normally connected to Helheimr. Is Helheimr the same as Niflheimr? No, it's probably either within Niflheimr or beyond it. Regardless, what we know is that if you want to get to Helheimr, you would have to go north and downward. Muspelheimr, however, is where fire and flames would be found, and that's where the fiery giants live. So if Helheimr is connected to the realm of mist and frozen darkness, then fiery gates doesn't really sound right. The majority of information we have when it comes to Norse mythology comes from a specific Icelandic writer called Snorri. And two things need to be kept in mind when talking about Snorri. First, he wrote parts of the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda in the 13th century. So this is way beyond the times in which this is said. And also remember the Snorri was a Christian. So there definitely was Christian influence into the representation of old pagan myths because the Christians of the 13th century Scandinavia were trying to accommodate early heathen beliefs, trying to connect them to now the new, modern, accepted Christian beliefs. And that's precisely why I don't think that the choice of fiery gates of hell was a happy one. Even though these gates of hell are described, they are described as being very high. And that's it, there are no flames. So if we were me, since we don't have a lot of information, but it is highly likely that the addition of fire, sulfur and damnation are all Christian, I would have removed fiery as an adjective and I would have instead said the dark gates of hell or perhaps the misty gates of hell. Also because the description of the journey then talks about a pitch black valley where you can't see anything. We are really trying to represent something that would be more connected to what would have been the sort of oral beliefs that would have been shared among the uh, Norse of the Viking Age. We should have gone for something frozen in the deep north. Okay, I know you're curious about the braces of this Valkyrie, so let's get that one out of the way now. 
Is this really such a stupid mistake as to forgetting to remove in Photoshop the freaking braces of the actress? No. I think what they did with this, since I am aware that there are some skulls that belong to Norse people of the Viking Age that did have some horizontal carvings in their teeth, which we could consider to be some sort of decoration or perhaps sort of early concept of a tattooing uh, of the teeth that some people did, I think that's what they were trying to represent. So let's not jump into, oh my gosh, they were so stupid and forgot the braces of the actress. I think that's what they were going for. Now, I don't think I would have done that if I were the advisor, not that I'm saying that I could be an advisor, but I'm saying if I were, I would have said, if you want to represent that, maybe do it on some actual humans, not on a, a mystical creature. But then again, it's fine if you want to do that. It's not that level of a mistake. Still, and in general, I don't really like helmets in this film. What about the puppies? Are the puppies historically accurate? I will praise the fact that we have got mail. Like, the armor, finally, they are ditching the leather jerkins, they are ditching the bolted black motorcycle gear, and they went for something much more historically accurate. I really appreciate the mail. Very weird, though, that I see something like this. Is this supposed to be some sort of fabric coif? If that's the case, I'll, I'll say cool. But if that's what I think it is, meaning a male coif with a rounded edge detached from the hauberk, then that would be incorrect because those don't appear in European history all the way up to the 13th century. What about the clothing? We see a lot of tunics. Are they historically accurate? Now, when it comes to the tunics, I'm very happy with what they have done. The colors are great. We see variety. We see blues and greens and reds. And that's exactly what the Norse used. And that's what archaeology pictographical evidence shows. So that I'm very happy about. I love the overall shape. Also, considering one of the first opening scenes, the scene where the father is murdered, it's kind of weird that they go with mounted archery, something that we know the Norse didn't do. Next point is going to be the shields. Do they look good? Are they historically accurate? The shields are something I'm very happy with. Usually um, shields in Viking films and movies are just, of course, they are round shields, but sometimes I've seen them represented as strapped on, which is horrible. In this film, they have got the correct grip, which is a handheld center bossed shield. And I like that it's, it looks like it's been made by someone who knows how to make uh, Viking shields. They must have contacted someone who creates a reenactment equipment, if you will. I like the fact that they didn't go for the metal rim, but they went for a rawhide rim which is most likely more common again iron rims existed too but it's nice that they went for that one rather than the typical thing everyone has got iron rims the bosses as well look good because they look handmade and not machine made and last but not least i like the fact that at least the front of the shield appears to be covered in some sort of textile or parchment which is again consistent with the historical examples Maybe I would have liked to also see the back of the shield covered in this textile, whereas in the movie it seems as if the back has got exposed blanks, but for what I can see, the shields are very believable, and I very much like that. Next point, the berserkers. Now, I've got a few things to say about this one. Berserkers are really difficult to represent and get right. Yes, of course they existed, I'm not saying that they didn't, but we don't exactly know what they did. It is highly likely that they ingested something that put them into some sort of trance. It's possible that they drank a lot before combat. And the fact that they are wearing wolf skin does have um, pictorial evidence. These are mostly medieval representations. So we don't know if the medieval authors that represented the Norse berserkers wearing these wolf skins were representing them that way because they had actual historical evidence that that happened, or if they were ascribing to what could have been considered a sort of legend. We don't know. But the pictorial evidence is there. At least we know that in the minds of people, this was something they did. So it is somewhat justifiable, but I wouldn't say that it's absolutely a 100% correct representation of what the berserkers looked like or what they did, because no one really knows. For the next part, the weapons. Last but not least, let's talk about combat. Definitely very flashy. There is one scene, however, that maybe people thought, oh, this is complete bullshit, that I think is excusable. And that is the scene where these berserkers are getting close to this fortification and then someone throws a javelin at the berserkers and the berserker grabs the, the javelin in the air, turns around and throws it back, killing the guy. Absurd scene, but it's justifiable because it's coming straight out of the saga. There is a combat scene 
scene described exactly as this one and so I think it was a nice touch to introduce it in the movie. It's, it's a little bit of a heroic scene that I feel has a place in a movie that is trying to merge fiction and reality together. The one scene that I didn't like, however, is the one where we see this battle, one of the few that we have got. In fact, I wish that the movie had more battles and combat scenes. I found it a little boring from when it comes to that department and a little slow, but there is this scene where they are sieging this place that has these very tall palisades, they're frigging jump over them, a little strange, but whatever. And then the uh, protagonist has got, so Amleth as a berserker is wielding an axe, which looks like a bearded axe, very believable, but he's also wielding a sword. The problem I have is that, of course, they had to have the character wielding it with the counter grip, meaning, so instead of holding it properly, he's holding it the other, the ninja style. I hate that. They put it everywhere and it has zero place in the majority of historical combat unless you're talking about a rondella or a knife. Don't give swords in the hands of fighters and have them grip them like a ninja. Should I say fictional ninja in fact. With that being said, all in all, I know that people will tell me, well, but it's fiction. There is one scene where you've got an undead fighting the guy, Amleth, but is it really? I mean, think about it, even that scene has two possible interpretations. We see it twice. Once the protagonist enters this burial mound and finds the sword, takes it from the corpse, and the corpse collapses. And in the previous representation of this scene instead, we see that the corpse comes to life and he has to fight the undead and behead it. We see both. And I think the reason for that specific choice is, we are not telling you if this is a fantasy movie or not. We are not telling you if this happened in the hero's mind or if actually something supernatural happened. They wanted to have reality and mythology mixed. I personally liked that choice, but it also means that the film isn't fantasy. It's both, and it's up to interpretation, but I did appreciate the research that they put. All right, number ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up, and if you're not yet members of this community, become a number one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to take advantage of the amazing offer by NordPass. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye.